Pakistan versus Canada, round three.
true. We believe that consumer, consumers generally don't have an extremely informed choice. This is because these internet gurus have a cult following. What this looks like is entire online communities and Reddit threads being dedicated to them. Entire Twitter pages and Instagram pages de being dedicated to these individuals, or these individuals having millions of followers on Instagram, where you have, whereby you have teenagers scrolling their Instagram pages every single day. Much of this association also dates back to years. This means that whenever these internet gurus develop association to a certain product, you as an individual who deeply associates with that, with that individual are likely to buy that product in the first place. Secondly, internet gurus often collude with each other. This looks like Jake Paul and Logan Paul colluding with each other and giving greater relevance to each other's products. This means that other gurus don't necessarily pass bad reviews when it comes to a certain product. Th thirdly, many of these inter internet gurus often build a perception of trust. That is to say, they often develop a deep association with that product. So they bring that you into their homes with their cameras. They show th that product or service being consumed by their friends and families, and tell their friends and families to give uh, to give biased reviews about that product. This de develops a perception of trust when it comes to that product, and likely forces you into buying that product. Lastly, why doesn't government regulation work? The reason that it doesn't work is because the primary platform to which you sell this is online. So Hustlers University is online. Therapy sessions are often offered on websites by internet gurus. Insofar as the internet is inherently not present on a national level, rather it is a global platform, it cannot be regulated by a single national government. The impact of this premise is that consumers have an extremely clouded judgment when it comes to buying these products, which means that they're less likely to be aware of the fact that these products have extremely bad quality in the first place. Why then are internet gurus likely to provide bad products and uh, services on their side? Firstly, independent of their quality, these are products and services that have extremely inflated prices. This is because they're deeply associated to that individual and they capitalize on the brand image of that internet guru, which is often seen as extremely exclusive. Secondly, these are gurus that often have exclusive control over narratives and media. That is to say, even if another individual on another corner of the internet passes a bad review, these are gurus that have the ability to saturate discourse surrounding that, surrounding that certain product or service and therefore have the ability to crowd out bad reviews insofar as they have such an essential control over media. Thirdly, these are gurus that generally are self-proclaimed experts in their own field. This means that they don't necessarily have the expertise or knowledge that is required to build a good product in the first place. KSI may be a fighter and he may be a self-proclaimed expert when it comes to energy drinks, but that doesn't necessarily mean that he has access to good products. Lastly though, we believe that many of these products are extremely addictive in the first place. This is because they're directly connected to the, uh, to the internet guru, which means that they're constantly forcing you into buying that product. This is a significant impact on individuals on two levels. For Firstly, vulnerable and impressionable consumers, that is to say 15 year olds scrolling on the internet, are forced into spending significant amounts of money on inflated products to buy these in the first place. But more importantly, these are individuals that often also draw you into bad investments. So they force you into investing within things like crypto on their side. But even if you don't buy products on their side, you still lose out on the exclusivity that these products provide you. Many of these internet gurus tell you that the only way that through which you can associate with us is by buying this product. This means that you're constantly disappointed at the point which you view the page of that internet guru who you deeply associated with. On the comparative, we believe, we believe that you directly buy things from uh, corporations. This is a significantly com better comparative for two reasons. Firstly, because you guarantee better quality on our side. Corporations don't have a huge brand image to rely on. They focus more on product quality. But secondly, internet gurus on our side, in the absence of selling their own products and services, give honest reviews about these corporations. They act as an intermediary. Their true role is to fill out the trust of consumers, and they're still better off. So proud to propose. <clears throat> All right, I thank that for speaking for the speech. I invite the leader of opposition to open the case for side off. Try that under our side. There are four things I'm going to chat about in my speech. 
Firstly, on framing from our side, then reputation to their claims, and then two of our own. Firstly, about why this is better product-wise, and secondly, about why this allows creators to make a living, and that is good. Firstly, on framing. The first thing to say is to expand the scope of this domain. I think what we are talking about here is not just like faux spirituality products or Hustlers University, but rather it is many, many other things as well that proposition neglects to mention. It is cookbooks, for example, put on or put out by internet chefs that undercut the prices of those traditionally in the market. It is the AP macroeconomics exam notes, for example, that are put out for money. Substacks that journalists use, like Matthew Iglesias, or merchandise that channels like Black Pen, Red Pen use, for example, to monetize their content. They are unnecessarily narrow in this. The second thing to say is on skepticism, and why we think under our side, people will be responsible and skeptical of these influences. The first thing to say is that there's competition between gurus. The nature of the market is that there are lots of people selling, and therefore, if your products are bad, you are quickly driven out of the market. Notably, most people follow multiple people within a sphere. So if you're interested in beauty, you do not just follow one influencer, you follow multiple. And therefore, multiple people have similar levels of credibility and cult of personality, and there is competition in that regard. The second thing to say is that there is online criticism. There are many, many channels who make money off of criticizing and exposing bad products. And there is demand for it because people want to know that they are getting good products. So this looks like, for example, CoffeeZilla, which is a channel about YouTube investigations that tore apart Jake Paul when he produced fraudulent cryptocurrency. The response from their side is collusion, but I have really no idea why there will be collusion, especially since these other companies and other channels make money off of that criticism, and that is what fuels their revenue. Thirdly, consider the timeline of this motion, which is that I think in many cases, perhaps, maybe some cases, scams have happened, but that has led to people being wary and suspicious of that. People are, in fact, suspicious of products produced on the internet, beauty products, for example, that they think might be risky towards them. And in that sense, they're less likely to be deceived or manipulated. The third thing to say here is that in cases where there are illegal, for example, products, we do not support selling that here. So what they need to engage with is the subset of cases where it is legal and where we think it is good. On their claims, the first thing they say is that this is misleading and people will buy blindly. What, as I pointed out in framing, trust is not blind. People are, in fact, skeptical, and we think will make good and responsible changes on this. But more importantly to note, I think in many cases your reputation and your cult of personality online is based on concrete measures. So for example, you as a travel blogger, you have a reputation because you know a lot about travel and you have expertise about that travel. And I think to that extent, uh, in many cases, the things that you will be selling are related to your product. So the cases that they're talking about where influencers, for example, sell drinks or sell candy bars are in fact the vast majority of cases in this space because it's unclear why your reputation extends across industries. Secondly, I think when they say the word viewership as an alternative to make money, what they in reality mean is advertising. And we think advertising under their side is likely to be far worse and more predatory for reasons we'll provide. The last two things they say are number one, these products are addictive. I'm completely unclear as to why this is a comparative argument. Corporations presumably also want to addict you, see at the selling of tobacco that led to hundreds of thousands of deaths. And the last thing they say is the cost is high because you have a cult of personality. I already explained why there is competition in that regard, so the cult of personality is not that significant. Argument one that on the premise of this argument is this, that the establishment often fails to serve the interests of people. We think gurus provide a plausible alternative. The first thing to say is that we think gurus are more likely to sell niche products that cater towards specific people who need it. This is because gurus have a specific audience who they cater to, who have a specific set of interests and needs. For example, a black beauty <coughs> influencer may have incentives to produce eco-friendly makeup for darker skin tones that a traditional industry may not. And the reason why we need gurus to do this is because the private corporations under their side do not have incentives to serve these people. That these are often small markets that they need to spend ad dollars catering to, or you are limited by geographic location, for example, if you are located within a white neighborhood. The comparative is that gurus already have an audience to begin with, so they do not need to spend the excess ad dollars catering towards that audience. But moreover, gurus we think do in fact have expertise on these issues. That the allergen-friendly granola bars that you put out as a product came from your own experience having a kid who had allergies as a kid, and you developed that. We think this makes good products. It means people have access to niche products that otherwise would not be able to get. The second thing to say in this argument is that we think gurus do, in fact, have incentives to provide cheaper and more accessible products for a variety of reasons. The first is that corporations often have monopolies that gurus can help break. And the reason why gurus explicitly are used for breaking them is because they can cross-subsidize attention from their channels and therefore get past the initial barrier to entry that many companies would not otherwise be able to. 
This looks like, for example, Jacob Clifford being able to sell AP macro nodes, which are cheaper and undercut the traditional market price, because otherwise AP has a monopoly, or like Princeton Review or whatever have a monopoly on those books. This drives prices down. For example, uh, in Australia, where the company High Smile produced toothpaste at a more affordable cost, for example, for consumers. The second thing to say is that expertise is often prohibitive. Under their side, cookbooks come from the haute cuisine person who has studied 20 years at a culinary school, and therefore they have to charge more to recoup costs. The point is that the guru, the cost of entry to begin with, is lower, and therefore they are able to charge them. But thirdly, because gurus generally care about offering accessible services, that you, every day, when you thought that your passion could not uh, become monetizable, that you engage with this community, you interact with this community, you watch your channel grow, and you are grateful for that. You love what you do, and therefore you have incentives to make sure that other people are able to do it as well. Point, sir. Pure. On one side, you're saying that these are extremely niche markets with a small number of consumers, but then you're also saying that there's immense competition to allow for you to not inflate prices. Please pick a side. No, that's not true. I think the fact that these guru markets are incredibly large is a reason why there are many different, even within small niche markets, that cater towards individuals. So there's still competition under our side, but corporations under your world do not have incentives to cater. Let's talk about creators. I think there are many people who depend on selling products, and this allows you to make money. Firstly, because this is often crucial to make and to support yourself. And notably, in many cases, the advertising market that they're talking about leaves many gurus out. So the fact that, for example, many people cannot have advertising to begin with because their primary audiences are poor people that rich advertisers do not want to cater to, so they don't get revenue. Or their political channels, for instance, who advertisers don't want to sell to for the risk of being controversial. This is bad for three reasons. Firstly, because it means you cannot produce your content under their wealth if you do not have merchandise, for example, to subsidize your cost. It means the depth of passion, it means that other people cannot get the value out of your content that we assume, uh, we presume that they have by the fact that they're consuming it in the first place. Secondly, because if you keep going, you cannot support yourself, and that is bad. But thirdly, because the alternatives are much worse. That you quit your YouTube job uh, on a substack to work a dead-end job in the newsroom. The benefits there are more concentrated. The money goes to the CEO, the staff, the shareholders, instead of you being self-employed. They filter out your expression. Noah Pino now writes for the New York Times and becomes a neoliberal show for Janet Yellen. But lastly, because I think it curtails your freedom as a person. That you no longer have time to take care of your three-year-old son and come to his theater productions at school because now you are working a nine-to-five job instead of the YouTube one you have. I think proposition catalyzes the death of meaning. They crush the blossoming ecosystem under our side, under the iron boot of capital. We oppose that on Canada. All right, and let's begin with the speech. I invite second speaker from side proposition. Starting in three, two, one, go. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> e-commerce or internet selling is good or bad. This is great, is specifically about internet gurus. What they're saying, 
we can like totally achieve that you can have small shops that can organically set up on the internet the fundamental distinction between that and the debate that we're having is that internet gurus are those people who for 10 or 15 years claim uh, act as bloggers or bloggers building a consistent fan base creating an artificial image but then they weaponize that into selling products this looks like Andrew Tate initially starting off a person who wants to help younger children but then when the moment that he hit the peak of his popularity he started a hustlers university company in which he exploited millions of 15 year olds into becoming patriarchal individuals this looks like Jake Paul who spent five or ten years of his career building a popular reputation as a daily blogger but then starting courses like entrepreneurship or road to becoming a billionaire in which millions of people were coerced into joining that this debate is specifically about those individuals who have a cult of personality and who use this cult of personality as an avenue to coerce individuals into buying their products second what is the winning pathway for propos proposition here a proposition our burden is not to defend that corporations are good compared to these particular individuals these advertisements can exist on either side but our burden is to show to you that the product that the internet gurus actually exploit these consumers in the vast majority of cases but the opposition has taken on a very unique burden that i was very surprised that they've they taken they have taken on the burden that every single product that these internet gurus are making is going to be a good product that is going to benefit these consumers. In absence of them proving this, they cannot build this debate. Firstly then, we told you that these products are going to be bad for multiple reasons. We gave you three or four reasons as to why you do not have some sort of skepticism, you, you do not have skepticism or accountability for these people. Number one, the fact that there is an inherent cult of personality. And I'll build this for you. I'm sure everyone here watches YouTubers and has their favorite bloggers or bloggers or bloggers. You were 15 year old, you watched a guy who was 15 year old too. You watched them play football, spend time with their family, spend time with their friends, etc. You watch their blogs every single day for 5 or 10 years. To a point where you become associated with their identity, with their life. You think of that YouTuber as your own family member. So the, so the amount of trust that you place on that individual is unprecedented. So when any other individual tries to criticize that, you do not receive that with some sort of rationalization, you become defensive. This looks like when individual try to criticize Taylor Swift for her songs, Swifties get angry. This looks like when you started to criticize Justin Bieber for having cornrows, you actively you, you, you went against that criticism and you said that this is something that we do not agree with because Justin Bieber is something that we love. This categorically frames out all of their ideas about skepticism, but I'll give you some other independent rebuttals as well. The second reputation to this skepticism idea is that they rely on the criticism of other YouTubers. The problem is that YouTubers who criticize these individuals often times have a significantly less popularity within that internet sphere because they do not rely on content content or like blogs or blogs etc which according to the algorithm does not pop up into the mainstream channels this fundamentally means that the amount of people that are receiving that criticism in the first place are significantly significantly limited so the impact of this criticism is something which is insignificant so that criticism does not really weigh in this debate Thirdly, they said that two other YouTubers also criticize each other. Two responses to this. Number one, they never engaged with the first proposition, when we told you in our first proposition speech, that YouTubers have an incentive to collude with each other. This can look like Jake Paul or Logan Paul colluding with each other. This can look like Logan Paul or KSI colluding with each other. Or Mr. Beast having a group of different YouTubers in which they hype up each other's products because there is a mutual benefit associated with it. The impact of this is fan bases of multiple different YouTubers could combine together and buy these products on a lot. Scale. But second, even if you have different YouTubers who are going against these each other, I'll flip this. This is a benefit on our side. Because the problem with that is that you create YouTube drama and YouTube contro controversy. The problem with YouTube controversy is the amount of viewership that you get, that these individuals get, becomes 10 times or 20 times high. This looks like when James Charles or Tati had a beef with each other because they were fighting over the quality of their products. Both of these individuals got extreme amounts of popularity and their products started selling at unprecedented rates. So they're not achieving their end point of people getting, like people having less products in the first place. Thirdly, individuals have a unique fear of missing out. So when KSI initiated, created bottles of Prime and started selling them within different markets, they became sold out in literally every single country because individuals wanted to be a part of that unique exclusive clique. Irrespective of the fact that the product is good or bad, individuals yeah. want to try that product so they can feel a part of a particular community. So they can tell each other that we are loyal fans in the first place. The problem with this is that these YouTubers do not necessarily have an incentive to create better products in the first place because 
you know that the image is something which can compensate for the lack of quality in those products. But before I move on, sure. James Charles lost a million subscribers. Logan Paul lost two million after being exposed for scams. Scrutiny does exist under our side, and that does deter products from being bad. Okay, so like that scrutiny that you're talking about is extremely, extremely temporary. And I know this. Logan Paul lost two million subscribers after the Japan suicide forest incident. But 10 years later, he's still popping up on mainstream boxing shows. He's still popping up on Australian tours, etc. He's still popping up on prime sponsorships, etc. This is extremely important because the, the impact of the criticism is extremely, extremely temporary. But these individuals are able to make a 15 second apology video on YouTube and regain all of their subscribers and then some. But thirdly, I'll talk about the fact that how, the, how this exclusively harms these consumers in the first place. Multiple reasons that were left unengaged with. Number one, the fact that time and money are zero sum resources and there is an inherent opportunity cost which is attached to it. Individuals are addicted to these products because these, because these internet gurus portray these products as if you do not have this, you cannot become a happy individual in life. Secondly, the buy in for alternatives becomes significantly lesser. So instead of getting actual therapy, instead of getting actual financial advice from expert individuals, you rely on these individual gurus or internet gurus because they claim to be experts experts on your side of the world. The problem with this is that effective help or actual help which can actively benefit these individuals is not received by them. But secondly, our principal got no refutation from their side. Our principal in this debate was that there is a unique power asymmetry between consumers and individual gurus. Individual gurus initially took a role of giving objective reviews which is our alternative. So you better inform consumers on our side. Consumers on their side, irrespective of good or bad projects, get make uninformed decisions. But my own extension, which will deal with their idea about about uh, individual gurus being benefited through financial means. Multiple multiple layers to this. Number one, notice how they're inconsistent with their own frame. If these products are essentially going to be cheaper products, then I don't necessarily, if the products are going to be essentially cheaper products, I don't see why these individual gurus are going to get that amount of capital in the first place. Second, you create a very negative culture on their side, in which individual, in which you can only become popular if you sell these products in the mainstream market. This creates a power asymmetry because the barrier of entry is increased on their side when other individual YouTubers who do not have enough access to capital cannot enter the algorithms or dominate the mainstream market in the first place. The problem with this is that small scale YouTubers or up and coming bloggers etc are disincentivized on your side. This idea about diversity is also tackled in this because corporations do have an incentive to cater to these people in the first place. Considering the fact that you have criticism, but that criticism is far more regulated because these are corporations which exist within legal frameworks. That criticism is far more appreciated because people are far more receptive to it because they do not have the same type of association compared to the association they have to these people on their side. We have better products on our side. Consumers make informed choices and individual uh, gurus make informed decisions. For all those reasons, give it to us. Alright, I'm going to speak of the speech, I have my second speaker from the side of the position. Excuse me, excuse me. Oh, sorry. That's perfect. After Logan Paul created CryptoZoo and tried to market cryptocurrencies to his viewers, he lost 2 million subscribers because the project failed. After Andrew Tate, which is their primary example, created Hustlers University and charged $500 to 14-year-old kids, I've not heard about him for the past three months. After people like Tati and James Charles created products that were toxic and were embroiled in controversy, they both lost 3 million like, subscribers. And in response to all of this, all that Pakistan has to say is, well, this criticism is temporary. They're right, this criticism is temporary, but we never see those things happen again. Logan Paul will never create a cryptocurrency again. James Charles will never create something that is going to hurt people ever again. People don't do things that they're criticized for, and you know, in the same way that Logan Paul was criticized for Japan's suicide force, he's never gonna film a dead body again. So those are the types of things that we get on our side of the house.
Our claim here was very simple. It was one, that this debate was not just about the silver bullet examples they wanted to use of Andrew Tate, which by the way have fallen through on their side of the house. This debate was one, about many influencers that actually care about delivering products, and we tell you why those influencers exist on our side of the house. This debate was two, about competition between corporations that we thought were evil and corrupt and broadly bad, that A, symmetrized the incentives that Pakistan wanted to focus on, or B, made them worse. Things like addictive products are much more prevalent when you're a corporation because you have much more money to spend on those things that doesn't exist on our side of the house. So the way I want to structure this debate then is by asking four things. First, I'll respond to their principle, which is very flimsy, and their third argument, which makes no sense. Then I'm going to analyze the incentives of consumers, then the incentives of creators, and then weigh up the products and creators that we get on our side of the house. On their principle, a primary principle claim here relies on a faulty assertion that the thing that objective guru, that gurus do is provide objective reviews. The first thing we point out in a POI is that this isn't true, right? The comparative on their side of the house is you rely on things like sponsorships and ad revenue, which is already a form of bias that is clearly not principally salient on their side of the house. Comparatively, people are idiots, and I'm frankly, like, it is ridiculous that this characterization exists on their side. People recognize that when a creator creates a product, it is within their incentive to go and shield that product. So presumably, the types of bias that exist on our side are much more flagrant and obvious compared to the types of biases that exist on their side when corporations sponsor it and you don't declare hashtag ad in your TikTok bias. So clearly their principle is worse on their side. On their third argument about how smaller creators are disincentivized from creating products, I don't see why this is just much worse on their side of the house. When you don't have a basic startup that you can actually sell products from, it is unclear why you'd be able to sell products on their side. It is unclear why you'd be able to compete with things like Dior or Chanel or these broad popular bands on their side of the house as well. You're disincentivized either way. If anything, it is on our side where a trend that actually tells you that you can sell these products, where a trend that tells consumers you can buy from people that aren't mainstream corporations, that now incentivizes people to go and innovate and create. So we actually flipped their third argument. It was very flimsy analysis from Pakistan. The first thing I want to analyze, what are the incentives of consumers? And here I want to compare their claims that consumers are largely motivated by cults of personality with our claim about, why about the incentives of consumers. I have a couple of responses to the calls for personality. The first thing we point out is this is not absolute, and they couldn't just use some rhetoric to paint this as absolute. Andrew Tate is probably one of the only examples of when people have been so compelled by their cult of personality that they've done this thing. We point out comparatively that there exists competition even within industries. That when you watch someone for makeup, you probably watch a variety of creators that create makeup content. And their response here is, well, collusion exists between their creators. One, I'd point out that their examples are flawed here again. Logan Paul and Jake Paul are brothers. Our claim here was that naturally you have incentives to compete insofar as you both want to create products that are better. But two, even when collusion exists, it's not absolute, right? So different products can still compete against each other. Different creators that have colluded together can compete against each other. So that's obviously true on our side of the house. But three, that cults of personality actively get criticized the second that they create a product. Andrew Tate was most effective when things like Hustlers University didn't exist, and it was all just TikTok edits. And the reason for this is quite simple. People are averse to loss. People really like their money, and people really, really hate being scammed. All of this is intuitive. It should be fairly obvious. And we point out then that this incentivizes creators to create products that are not scams. So if their only response to this after 16 minutes of analysis was cults of personality and collusion, then I will point out that even those cults of personality are held to account on our side of the house because people want products that actually deliver. The second thing we say, and this was all of the analysis that we gave that they don't respond to, that one, most creators aren't under trade. And when you actively care about the thing like cooking or education, for example, you, one, have probably spent a lot of time doing this. Notably, things like social media are a risky industry to go into on our side of the house. So the point at which you've spent 10 or 15 years to build up a brand image in every other industry that isn't a get rich scheme, in education, in cooking, in makeup, etc., etc., chances are you did it because you actually did something good, right? You helped people create cheaper meals. You actively helped me out on my AP macroeconomics exam. And that is the reason for why I'm going to care about you. So if your reputation was built on providing objectively good things for individuals, that reputation is now screwed over in Pakistan's world if you deliver a bad product. So clearly for the vast, vast, vast majority of people in this debate, you were going to deliver a good product. It wasn't enough for them to say that you wouldn't. But the next thing we point out, 
is that actually skepticism has increased, and Pakistan responds to this in three ways. The first thing they say is criticism actually makes people more defensive. The one thing I'll point out is no, because I think as we point out, people have a more closer attachment to their money and getting a delivery of a good product than they do to a nebulous cult of personality that exists. So clearly if criticism points out and speaks to your more visceral reaction that, hey, Logan Paul gave me a bad product, then chances are you actually interact with this criticism. The second response they give is, ah, uh, but like echo chambers exist. You know, I, I think this is an imperfect response because echo chambers still interact with each other and their own and their own exact response for a POI about how controversy exists seems to indicate that you actually do interact with the other side on our side of the house. But three, I think I've already responded to the temporary, temporariness of criticism, which is that even if it's true that criticism is temporary, it still causes the change that we're talking about on our side of the house. But then they don't respond to all of our other mechanisms under criticism, Point. which were one, that this is a like this is a status quo debate, so things like crypto have largely crashed, the worst excesses of harms have largely crashed, and that is largely because the vast majority of people aren't right-wing anti-establishmentarians or 14-year-old toxic boys, but rather, but rather people that are actively influenced by things like criticism, and therefore buy things like positive products on our side of the house. I'll take the POI. Internet gurus can still earn money from viewership, from AdSense, from Patreon or donations or Twitch. The only way you can prove the exclusivity of uh, exclusivity of products and services is that inflated prices. If not, you don't achieve your impacts of financial. No, no, no. The point is, you get startup costs from things like AdSense, from things like that. When you're a guru, for example, like Jacob Clifford, who wants to keep creating free products, the point at which there's heavy competition between different influencers, etc., etc., you are often forced to rely on creating products on our side of the house, which actually allows me to access our impacts here much better. One. We point out for a variety of reasons that corporations are much worse when it comes to actually understanding the needs of people. They often leave out niche markets that are really, really important. They often deliver goods because they have the capacity to monopolize in the first place. And that doesn't exist on our side of the house when competition means that you can deliver products for better. Two, we allow people to use the startup costs that they've made up through creating their cults of, well, not cults of personality, but through creating their internet, like internet, sorry, like base, and then use that money that they make from things like AdSense to then go and create these products that allows you to skirt the types of startup costs that otherwise don't let those products come up. So if their comparative in this debate was, well, a black person still creates like, you know, dark, like dark skin colored products. The point is, those products never become successful. And you can't just create those products because you never had the startup costs to create those products in the first place. So by the end of this debate, there's three things that make the ballot very clear for us. One, internet gurus provide good services and have better incentives than corporations. Two, we neuter the worst excesses of the harms they want to narrow their case to. And three, the comparative is far better when it comes to the livelihood of these creators. need in this debate is to head on tackle the monopoly of large scale multinational corporations. My problem is that this need is already being met by online online brands etc. by small scale companies etc. This is an organic process that is already happening through avenues such as online settings, avenues such as e-commerce etc. So most of the benefits that we are trying to access are not exclusive to internet gurus and internet internet gurus to begin with. Because no, the point is that online companies, online brands, small scale, small scale corporations exist regardless of internet gurus trying to sell their own products or not. Remember, not all online companies need to brand themselves with the name of Gary Vee or Andrew Tate to sell their products. They can act like normal corporations, they can still try to break monopoly, they can still access niche markets, etc. Most of the benefits that they're trying to access is not existed. Pointed out by my second speaker, never responded. Second, 
They say that now we have more educational co educational content content creators, and that these people are inherently motivated by let's say altruistic incentives. First, if that is true, this also means that maybe these people do not require that much money or inflationary prices or that much profit margin as you may as you, as you may point out to be. If the level of financial support that they are demanding is very minimal, that level of financial support already comes through let's say Google Google Ads etc. That level of financial support already comes through Patreon and donations and other other methods of online earning earning etc. But also note, education. Did these people become educational content creators after becoming internet gurus, or did internet gurus become educational content creators? Remember, this debate is about internet gurus then trying to become, let's say, educational content creators in their in their best case. Remember, let's say people like Sa Khan opening up Khan Academy still exist on our side of the house because these people never posed as internet gurus. They started off their journey as general educational content creators. This debate is about a very specific type of influencer to begin with. I'm going to talk about three things in this debate: the principle on the on the benefit to consumers and whether or not there is enough financial support to the influencer. First, on the principle, they say, "Well, our principle is flimsy." That is their first response. Second response is that our principle is not exclusive because sponsorships will also generate a conflict of interest. No. First of all, our alternative is mainly through Google AdSense, etc. These are ads generated by the interest of the consumer and not by the choice of the influencer. Patreon donations, so there is no conflict of interest. But even in our worst case, where these people are at trying to access financial financial support through let's say through let's say sponsorships, etc. The point of third-party sponsorships is that you explicate that this is a sponsorship, that this is an ad that you are giving. For example, Johnny Harris in his videos. Let's say point C, point C yellow mark. As to now, this is an ad. If you put, if you down this, I'm starting an ad for the next three minutes. You you can watch it. And these people explicate that this is an ad. They are using it to generate their revenue. This means that they explicate the conflict of interest. The problem on their side of the house is that for a long span of time, these people posed as generally reliable people, as people who had no interest in the market whatsoever. For example, vloggers like the, doing doing let's say food reviews in Hawaii obviously did not at that point have an incentive to let's say prioritize. One restaurant, one restaurant or one food place over the other. But once they do have a restaurant or a food place of their own, it is obvious that they are going to try to prioritize on their own. But why is this principle important in this debate, and why is this principle match winning? We as a society already recognize the precedent that conflict of interest should be condemned. For example, let's say the bosses of corporate spaces are not allowed to let's say imagine if they became also the bosses of HR spaces because of course there is also a conflict of interest. If the complaint is against them, they cannot become the adjudicator. For example, a lawyer cannot become a judge in a court trial. We do as a society recognize that conflict of interest should not exist. You should not take on dual roles which are mutually contradictory. But this principle is also match winning because let's say not all, of course not all let's say influencers do this. But there is an avenue of potential harm. Even when potential harm exists, these people let's say should be stopped from doing this because already as a society we recognize that when there is an avenue of potential harm, we still condemn that action. For example, not all of us are murderers or hijackers, but none of us is allowed to carry weapons onto the airplane. So we as a society recognize that when there is a potential harm, that yeah. potential harm of conflict of interest, we are going to condemn that. Before I move on to the second issue, I'll take a point. Why is that you that gurus only rely on AdSense on your side of the house if it's true that they're so money hungry? Why don't they turn towards sponsorships and why don't then harm? That's my third issue. Second, second issue of this debate on benefit to consumers and on good products. What I want, I want you to note the framing of this debate. First, if niche audiences can give you money, etc. Then corporations also, of course, have an incentive to cater to these niche markets. They say, of course, there are geographical barriers, but like, buddy, online corporations and online selling firms all also exist. They do not face these geographical barrier barriers barriers to begin with. So the if the the incentive to be let's say profitable, etc., is symmetric on both sides of the house between an online guru and a real and a real and a, and a real corporation. But here's the point: Why do these people then make a good have an incentive to make good products? These are the mitigating market 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 forces on their side of the house. These mitigating market forces do not exist because online spaces are fundamentally less regulated. Specifically, when you are not registered as a seller or as a company on the online space to begin with, you are just a dude on on your YouTube video talking, re referring to an another website on which you are selling you are selling your product. A real life corporation is registered as such. It is under the legal bound. It is far more regulated on our on our side on our side of the house. But let's deal with them one by one. Okay, they will cater. To, they will cater to niche audiences, but they also want to cater to large number of people. I.e., and this is a very unfortunate event that no YouTuber in Pakistan will try to cater to the needs of let's say LGBTQ people because they will not have subscribers over let's say a few, a few, a few thousands because people are fundamentally condemned from engaging in in this in such a culture. 
This means that if they are motivated to have large number of subscribers, they will not fundamentally try to do what you are what you are claiming for them. But let's say the incentive is symmetric. We think that corporations, when they cater to these niche markets, are far more better because they have a more even if delayed, they have a more impactful impact. What do I mean by this? Corporations can corporations can lo lobby the Congress. Corporations can lobby politics into actually now making legislation with let's say now catering to LGBTQ people. Now the market is made more accessible. But these corporations are also far more visible in general society. This means they have a far more greater impact rather than exclusionary echo chambers on your side of the house. Second, these people are inherent experts, so you should you should, you should take everything that they say. First, I don't think that every expert in a field is going to become an influencer. These are specifically the people who are, let's say, who are like mediocre level experts, but also the ability to YouTube themselves, but also the ability to market themselves. These are the very unique subset of people who can do both. I don't think that these are the best people, but again, they do not have the incentive to utilize their expertise when they have the incentive to reading incentive or profit. But they say that criticism will come and accountability and criticism is very important. Let's compare the two. Criticism from fans on their side, because remember, these are not consumers just that they're buying their product. These are fans, they have, they have built a fan base for themselves, versus genuine consumers on our side of the house. They say that people recognize scam. No, people do not recognize scam. How is one going to recognize scam after taking Andrew Tate's masterclass? Maybe I've not become a man. I don't feel. I don't. I don't feel like myself. Is that how people are going to recognize scams? The fundamental mechanism through which they market themselves make them prone to a lack of prone to a lack of credibility. But let's say, even in their best case, you criticize one influencer, that influencer shuts up. But this market is such that thousand more influencers because they see that this negative attention is very good. They can capitalize on this negative attention. They can take it even after five or ten years. This means that the scale of impact is far worse off on their side of the house. Lastly. You have two modes of financial support as an influencer, either through the mechanism that we've told you or their mechanisms. Our mechanisms are better because these are accessible to all influencers. You do not have to build a name around yourself to access these to access these benefits. If it is an equitable influencer market, this means the benefit is, is to consumer because now they have a vast, vast variety, variety of let's say reviews and reviews, etc. to choose from. The finishing wing of this debate is this. Maybe we have less internet gurus on our side of the house, but all those internet gurus are doing the job that they were supposed to do. This means that consumers are protected on our side of the house. Consumers are the most vulnerable stakeholders of this debate. That is the part we need to be here. All right. <clears throat> Thank that speaker for the speech. Inviting the last of chapter speech of the debate, I invite third opposition. While it is convenient for them, Pakistan argues that the alternative to, uh, to our side is still dispersed independent vendors. They will still have things like different clothing and makeup, and as such, they will be able to obtain things like diverse products. But confusingly, when it comes to institutions that they happen to dislike, things like unlicensed therapists, their stance collapses upon itself. Now they only support large institutions as an alternative. They say you, can, you will go to licensed therapists. These will be the, uh, how people primarily get these goods. I think Pakistan this debate needs to take a lane. Either it is the case that people in their world will still go to things like Etsy and eBay to find different products, in which case they do not get their benefits of things like licensing or, or legitimacy, or they choose to defend large corporations, in which case you still get the harms of exploitation of abuse and neglect that, 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 that we talked to you about. That you can't have it both ways. By contrast, I think our case here was clear. We said you need influencers in order for these small vendors to be able to legitimately compete in an oversaturated market. It is not enough for you to just randomly have your business on Etsy with no person with, uh, with no person of, of, of public attention being able to properly advertise this product. Just exist on a random corner of the internet where people cannot see you or know that your product exists. You need influencers to exist in order for these types of small products to get attention, to get publicity, for people to know and be able to interact with them. And that is the unique reason as to why these products don't happen on their side. In the absence of that, you will be forced into the mainstream, where there aren't products that adequately cater towards you, where you aren't able, as a friend who's a minority group, to get the niche services that you need. 
What I want to do in this speech then is firstly engage with their, their stance Point. of like e-commerce, explain why this no thank you deal like takes out many of their own claims and why they're still preferable in this case. Second of all, I'll bring back the more reasonable claims in terms of why products and services expand and act on our side. On the first issue of e-commerce, I think only very limited fragments of the, of the proposition case are actually left under a stance where they say they support similarly dispersed markets but without the specific mechanism of influencers or blogs. For, for example, their, their material on how corporations have real regulations and are thus better clearly does not work in a world in which their comparative is people will just go to Etsy and find these products anyways. Their material on why expertise is necessary does not make sense in a world where you go to these banned dispersed markets. Their point on why corporations are more visible, no thank you, and thus will have more accountability does not make sense in a world, no thanks, where you will just go to random internet vendors anyways. So the only thing that, that uh, part of their case that actually makes sense under this stand is their principled argument on why it is unethical to have conflicts of interest. I think this claim is kind of incoherent. It says you began as a blogger and advertised yourself as a blogger, therefore you must always be a blogger. There is not like a specific reason as to why you can't change rules over time and occupy multiple things. Secondly, to the extent that there is a conflict of interest, I think people know that it exists. So like, as per their own suggestion, you are being constantly advertised as product. I think people can probably use their brains to a degree and see that this person is selling the product and then evaluate that they must have profit incentives from that point on. I think we give you many illustrations of this type of public accountability. And thirdly, I don't think the type of like legal, no thank you, context that they suggest actually exists. Like, advertising your own product is not illegal. If you are a corporation, you are allowed to produce massive amounts of marketing towards your product. It's deeply unclear to us why a small blogger should not have the same moral ability. And there's no real attempt to weigh this argument until, again, any of the numerous practical concerns that we give you in this round, in terms of why someone, for instance, just cannot access therapy at all in their world if they are forced to go to a therapist that costs $200 an hour. No attempt to like explain how this principle falls into the ground. So I think that's why, even in a world where they support e-commerce as an alternative, their constructive case primarily does not exist. And what you want to credit instead is our material in terms of why influencers are specifically necessary in this case in order to direct people to the product they need. That is incredibly <coughs> difficult as the average working class person in the world to just go onto the internet, browse millions of products, and find the one that happens to cater to your unique needs. Whereas in a world where bloggers and influencers that you trust are able to direct you toward those products, you are more likely to seek them out. Second theme then on why these products and services are likely to be legitimate and helpful towards these people. I'll take the point. People are able to rationalize their purchases on eBay or corporations because they're not personally associated to the CEO. Show to us how that benefit exists on your side when you've been watching a guy for more than 15 years. Oh yeah, so I'll find this under my family. I don't have a point of how bizarre and deeply confusing Pakistan's picture of human psychology in this crowd is. Like, listen to how extremist their language is. They say, when you are 11, you start watching this YouTuber, you have this intimate and long-lasting connection with them. And then, 15 years down the line, you buy things from any price of them because there's a cult of personality. Like, this is not the real world, guys. I don't think influencers are Mao Zedong. These are like people in the world who have YouTubers that they watch. It doesn't mean that you have complete and unquestioning faith in them. And there are just lots of reasons that we gave you as to why this is the case. Firstly, it's just like untrue for lots of people. I think people care about real material things in the world more than some random pixelated man on a screen on YouTube they watched for like, a, a, you know, an hour one time. Second of all, to the extent that you care about this field, there can be multiple influencers to watch. So if I'm deeply invested in skincare, I can buy and like I spend a lot of time on Twitter, probably there are multiple different influencers who criticize each other's products, so I'm unlikely to have unquestioning blind faith in this one person. And third of all, at their best, you probably buy this product one time. So if you buy this skincare product and then it gives you a rash, you're not buying it again, no matter how much like an influencer shouts at you on YouTube about doing it. The harm there is, I think, minimal. Then they have a few other reasons. They say there is no expertise. It's actually deeply unclear why you need to be licensed in really any case other than maybe medicine, So, which we have told you we do not support in cases where it is actively illegal. So like, for instance, if you're just producing like clothing, you don't need a clothing license to do that. Even, thing, uh, uh, we think even in the case of things like mental health, for instance, the system of licensing is a deeply Eurocentric one that prioritizes some people's beliefs in how psychology works, whereas lots of people from other societies uh, often find like alternative therapies useful. And I don't think there's a coherent attempt to explain why licensing in all cases is actually good. And then lastly, they say it's difficult to regulate. We suggest that corporations and major institutions are far more difficult to regulate because they have things like armies of lawyers. A large clothing company like Nike can evade labor laws and burn chemicals into the eyes of millions of Vietnamese children because they have like a thousand lawyers to squash all corporations. Whereas a medium-sized influencer selling their own clothing line doesn't have the capital to do this and is forced to behave more Point. like you. So we are actually the side of you and we should get more accountability. Then we give you lots of competing reasons as to why it is in fact true that there would be skepticism here. And to be clear, this was not 
solely about each individual product receiving skepticism. It was generally that we exist in an sure. era where people, after no thank you, the last few decades, no thank you, no thanks, um, have generally become conscious of the fact that there are things like internet scams that most people in our generation have grown up into an era where they are conscious of this, that there is massive publicity within social media upon the risks of these things, and so I don't think it is true that people blindly buy into these things to the degree that they talk about. What is left then in this round is our simple, largely unresponded to, other than stand stuff, material in terms of why people get access to products that are good for them. That when an influencer or a blogger that you care about directs you to a product that is good for you, you are now able to benefit from them. Mainstream corporations will cater either to the majority or to people who have the most capital to buy these products because they want to capture a large portion of the market. Things like licensing and certification are inherently costly because it explains why therapy costs so much money in a traditional institution, whereas it doesn't online. This means that in their world, people are denied goods and services that have value to them. This is a question of utility, but it is also one of fairness. We think it is deeply unfair that until the last few decades, millions of people who happen to exist in larger bodies were forced to wear clothing and made them feel deeply insecure and anxious because the H&M didn't have the profit incentives to care about them. We think it is unfair that, working deal, that a working class person in a dark, depressive spiral has nobody to turn to because they cannot put a $200 bill for therapy with a psychiatrist. This is our own example of fake to be with mental health. Look, our products are imperfect, but the alternative is a world in which many people do not have options at all. And we think it is deeply patronizing for them to say we ought to deprive people of all choices because they think they will choose incorrectly. We offer people more optionality and things that have value and meaning. That is why we are proud of this. Alright, and then let's be able to speech, calling upon opposition reply. Uh, can I go to the workshop? That's fine. You guys can start with the workshop. I mean, we can wait for you to come back. I mean, it will take five minutes. Like, can I go after the reply? Yeah, can I take your tissue then? Yeah, yeah. sure. Okay, okay. Um, you can see it. Okay. Proofed. Secret food. notice how hyperbolic the proposition rhetoric becomes in this way. They say, you watch this person as you grow up. You worship them like your father. They are the only one you watch. They are a beacon of glittering hope in your life, and they are the source of your hope, and you believe them at all costs. If all of this is true, all of their impacts are symmetric. Firstly, because they can still force you to spend money on sponsorships, as we told you from first, and they can still coerce you in all of those harmful ways. But secondly, because even if they cannot force you in monetary ways, they can still influence your views. I want to point out how truly bizarre it is. Their problem with Andrew Tate is he's spending $50 on Husser's University, and not that he is still influencing people's views to be misogynistic, which he can still do under either side of the house. I think what Pakistan needed to do in this debate, and what they didn't, was engage in a more moderate case of real people in this debate. People who did, in fact, watch multiple, for example, people, who they did have commitments to, people who did have some sense of self-preservation and scrutiny, and that, on all grounds, meant that we won this debate. I'm going to chat about four things. One on creators, two on consumers, three on scrutiny, and four on the principle. One on creators. I start with this because there was virtually no engagement to this argument. We told you this was good to support their dreams, to help people who creators care about, to share their opinions with the world. The only response we got from Pakistan was that there was advertising. Firstly, we came out in first and told you that not everyone can access this advertising, something we still have not responded to. The black video game player, for example, whose videos may be about something related to growing up poor and how their primary audience is not one that corporates and wants to target. A Ukrainian political activist wants to cry out at the world, but cannot under their world because advertisers will not fund them because it is not politically possible. Patreon is insufficient in these cases. What we do need is an independent way for people to make money. Secondly, because advertising was worse for all the reasons that they gave, that it was exploitative because there are no ethics involved. You don't care about the people you're selling to. The only thing that matters is the bottom line. If they care about addictive products, corporations do that the exact same too, as we pointed out throughout the match. The only response we got from their side is that there are legal checks on the things that corporations can do. I think as Anushka points out, corporations have excessive power to avoid those legal checks. If the law is what matters, under our side, people who are gurus have to respect the law. They cannot offer illegal medical services because they would be prosecuted for doing so. We prove that traders are better off. Their side ensures the depth of trades. I think that is inherently bad, and they do not respond. On consumers, we said that the only people who are exclusively able to cater towards niche markets 
were these groups. There are three things that they do. Firstly, they create a fictional trade-off about how when you have gurus, corporations cannot cater to these markets. That is not true. Corporations will be able to cater towards them under either side of the house. Our point was that this is an important source of competition to corporations who often lack to the APs, to the college boards, to the Princeton reviews of the world. Secondly, they say e-commerce is the solution. This again ignores all of the mechanization we gave in first about why it is explicitly gurus who can overcome the initial barrier of attention to get your product launched and in the market. They say, well, these things if are profitable, corporations will target them either way. But often they are not ultra profitable enough for corporations to want to target them. It is only gurus who care about these markets and want to sell them. The last thing they say in third is that there is no incentive to do this because it is controversial. That is true under their side of the house more when the only thing you rely on is advertising and sponsorships. If they care about the Pakistani who wants to talk about political issues, it is in fact our side that gives them the money to buttress against that. On scrutiny, I think what I do here is just repeat a bunch of things we've already responded to in this debate. We told you a few things. We said there was competition. Most people, in fact, do not watch a single person. There is cult of personality in multiple places. There is scrutiny, but also there is wariness around the things that people do. Even if they are correct, the first thing to point out is that their scams are few in number. You often get scammed once, and then it will never happen again. So if you weigh that against our benefits, I think they are greater. But two and more importantly, because the people under their set house will probably be scammed anyways. If you do not trust therapeutic institutions, and you will not go to them, then even if you do not have a guru telling you to do so, you still will not do that, and in fact, the alternative may be worse. The last thing they say is on the principle. The conflict of interest exists under either side of the house. Under their side, it is with corporations. Under our side, perhaps, it is with gurus to some extent. But what they do not engage with is all the benefits we give under our side about how this opens up options, limits monopolies, and why that is good. All right, I'm going to speak about the speech for one of the final speeches of the debate. Uh, government reply. into paying $300 to Mr. Bees. I don't think he was aware of the fact, I don't think he took into account the fact that Mr. Beat had a huge personal association to him and therefore Mr. Beast may have exploited his consumer tasks for his own benefit. I think they're mischaracterizing the amount of support that these individuals give to internet gurus, the amount of association that they have. Insofar as they're mischaracterizing that, I think they lose this debate. A few strategic observations I want to make before my two main issues. Firstly, I want you to note their impacts. They're extremely narrow because their two impacts are that you cater to niche demand and you help internet gurus. Compare that to all of our impacts about you being drawn into addictive products, about you not going to actual mechanisms of help like licensed products, about 15-year-old vulnerable actors and consumers of YouTubers are drawn into products that are bad for them. These are impacts that they haven't dealt with. Talking about niche markets won't win them this debate because we're dealing with insignificant majorities, not small minorities. But even if I'm to take these impacts at their best. Note that they're extremely marginal because mechanisms to achieve these impacts exist in the status quo. If they're talking about niche markets, small-scale businesses, e-commerce, corporations still exist on our side. They still have the ability to provide that access to a certain extent. Their impact is very marginal. When it comes to setup costs, Patreon, social media is, uh, apps still exist on our side. Their only reply to this was when gaining viewerships requires a lot of time and energy. That's not true, right? Because of the interpersonal nature that you have with bloggers, they can literally make a small house store, post that on five different social media ads and, uh, apps and earn like a month's worth of allowance from that, right? I don't think the amount of cost that they're painting out is that significant. I think these mechanisms are much more equitable and much more accessible. But the second thing I want you to note is that strategically they're inconsistent. They're saying that inter internet gurus don't have a significant amount of following, they only compete within small niche markets. If that is true, and they're not competing within profitable markets, then all of their impacts never materialize in the first place, because they don't have the ability to keep compete with corporations on their side, because they don't have that brand image. On their side, they don't have the ability to actually go forward and provide that access to people within developing countries, African American individuals who don't have the ability to afford essentials, right? I don't think they materialize their impacts on their side. Two issues then within my speech, firstly on the principle and secondly on consumers. Our principle on the conflict of interest was pretty simple, right? We told you that consumers deeply trust gurus because they give them good reviews. They do things like give them very realistic experiences. Internet gurus are entirely based on the idea of realism, i.e. you going, 
going and giving realistic experiences through blogs and bloggers to individuals. Therefore, internet gurus and their rise to fame ex has exclusively relied on consumers that they're catering to in the first place. When internet gurus exploit this support by sensationalizing their products or by blocking out bad reviews, we believe that they're inherently harming consumers, they're violating that trust. The only response to this, both at second and third, which by the way, the, the principle was ignored at first, is that roles change and that's justified. Fine, roles can change, but the problem is that consumers don't know this role changes in the first place. Internet gurus have an incentive to make sure that co uh, their consumers are never aware of the fact that their roles have changed, changed from being a blogger or a blogger to someone who produces products. And so far as that is true, insofar as gurus have an interest not to reveal that their roles have changed, they still exploit that conflict of interest. The second issue then on consumers. We give you heaps of analysis about the harms on our side, about how you have inflated prices independent of whether the products are good because they are attached to a certain individual, about how these product quality is going to be bad because these are self-proclaimed experts, not licensed individuals, and how these are extremely addictive options. Their response to this was backlash. We told you backlash, even if in their best case happens, is very temporal because they have the ability to collude with other reviewers, block out bad reviews. They have strong control over narratives on social media apps so they can block out bad reviews. They can scapegoat their responsibility and make up like a small apology video and let all of that go away and disassociate with that. But even if I accept backlash, an exclusive harm still remains. You deeply associated with a person for 15 years, now they're telling you that the only way that you can associate with them is with buying their product. You don't have the ability to afford that, you don't become the part of that community, you're left out on our side. Corporations deal with the spectrum, they're much better on our side. So proud of